Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. Give you a few moments to come on in as we begin our Moon Bible study for New Bethel. Come on in. Alright, we are streaming live, Noon Bible Study, New Bethel. As you can see, I am not at, in my office at the church, but I am in my office here at home. And I uh, invite you to come on in and join us for Noon Bible Study. Tell a friend that we are live, and we are here, and we're ready. Amen. Alright. Just a few more minutes, uh, about another minute, then we'll get started with prayer. And uh, get started with prayer, and we'll be talking again, continuing our series, The Case for Suffering. And uh, hope that you have been blessed by the last few uh, studies that we've done on suffering. A little more time for you to come in. All right, we're about two minutes. All right, so let's go ahead and open up with prayer. And we'll start our scripture reading. And the text that we're going to launch from for this particular series will be Romans chapter 5. And yes, if you with us uh, earlier this this uh, summer, and uh, we we use chapter Romans chapter five, we did five through eight of Romans. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you for your mercy, for your loving kindness, for your goodness that is with us and allows us to see. Uh, mercies, new mercies every day, the compassions that I knew, great is your faithfulness to us. God, as we go into this study, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from our unrighteousness, blot out our iniquities. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your unction that enables us to not only hear from you, be led by you, but also be taught by you. Let your anointing reign with us, uh, pour over us. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we may know the hope of our inheritance, the calling that we have with all those in the faith. Bless this our time together. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Yes, you will hear Jackson in the background because he hears me talking and he's just staring at me right now. So... Wondering who I'm talking to. Just nosy. I have a nosy dog. <laughs> All right. So we're talking the case for suffering. And we've been talking about this the last several weeks. And the idea of suffering. Something that we all can identify with. Um, there are some who say that suffering uh, should not be a part of Christian experience. And I beg to differ. I say if you are a Christian, you should suffer. And you should suffer for one or two things, one of three things. You should suffer for the sake of Christ being persecuted. You should suffer for the sake of uh, development and growth and maturity. Uh, well, those are the only two. And you should suffer uh, as Christ suffered in the sense of giving up, laying down your life, taking up your cross. So, um, we talked last week about punitive suffering. Punitive suffering being, good afternoon, Sister Walker. Punitive suffering being that which um, comes as a consequence 
of behavior or sin uh, or rejection of uh, God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Um, punitive in the sense that what we deserve we we should get but mercy God's mercy does not get it to us we don't get what we deserve we have grace and mercy because of that and um, that's something we should all celebrate and be thankful for today we're going to talk about uh, the suffering of the innocent as well as uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of the suffering for righteousness but we're going to talk about the suffering of the innocent. One of the questions I have gotten over the years, I've been in ministry and I've asked myself, um, and I've read about, and you probably have read about it yourself, the question is, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? And if you haven't asked that question yet, uh, you will ask that question. Being from Louisiana, living in South Louisiana, uh, and those now in Mississippi, uh, we're, we're seeing now suffering is a part of our existence uh, as we are witnessing in real time the possibility of a hurricane, uh, possible level uh, what, what, one, two, or three, they're, that's what they're predicting, and in a few days as we observe the 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina as well as later on in the months Hurricane Rita and all the other hurricanes that happened in 2005 that did do is they did a whole lot of destruction I was one of those impacted <laughs> by those hurricanes that seemed to come back back to back during that particular year uh, but when we asked when we ask about suffering and why people suffer, or particularly why is it that it seems that good people suffer for no reason, we, we, we want to ask, and some of us have been conditioned to never ask God, don't question God, don't, don't, don't ask God those kind of questions because uh, that's offensive to Him. Well, I don't believe it's offensive to Him, and that's not exactly what the old folks say, I'm just, just kind of using that language. Um, what, why do, why does it seem that good people suffer unnecessarily? And this is what we call the suffering of the innocent. And we have uh, scriptural F, uh, references that we'll be using uh, to support this idea, the suffering of the innocent. What do we mean by innocent? That's the first question. Well, by innocent, we're not talking about persons who have not done wrong. Because when we look at, from the, through the lens of faith and through the lens of Christianity, we learn that all have sinned. Matter of fact, Paul writes it in Romans chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and within the context of his writing he's including Jews and Gentiles and we call it uh, we have come to know this as the doctrine of original sin and that is saying that because of at the punitive consequences of, of Adam and Eve uh, punitive consequences of death and uh, that that flowed from from them onwards to now, and uh, and in that sense, because of that that thing that 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 sin, we all suffer uh, in the, in the, the same condition of sin. We are all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, as one some writer uh, writes it. So. Paul sees suffering through the lens similar to what we use, what the James wrote about in chapter one, what we use as our initial uh, launching scripture, James one two through eight, where James says that 
you ought to count it joy when you go through suffering because suffering produces certain character uh, traits that every Christian should have. And I want to differentiate the character traits from the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about uh, uh, earlier this year. So let's go to Romans chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading at verse 2. And, uh, well, we'll read at verse 1 and read down to verse 5. But you can read throughout the entire chapter of Romans chapter 5 because it's supporting the initial statement uh, beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 5 just for our purposes. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Through whom we also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the, this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And notice he uses this word exult. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulations, and this is a, a, another word for suffering, or uh, suffering, tribulation brings about perseverance. And you hear that same theme along with the writing in James chapter 1. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, Paul is writing along the line is saying that suffering should be a means of boasting that you are a part of God's body. That you are uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. That you are being uh, made into new creations. Old things are being passed away or have passed away and behold all things are becoming new. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. So Paul sees this experience of suffering, tribulations, trials, temptations, all of that. Um, he sees that as a means of finding something to brag about God. And we don't see it that way, but that is how it should be seen. At least that's how Paul saw it and uh, articulated it to his audience in his letters. So Paul sees suffering as a means of bragging about your relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And he's saying the word exult is, is pretty much boasting, bragging. Uh, I wouldn't say celebrating. I, I wouldn't use that word, but along those same frame of thought, that um, we have a hope because of grace. We have a hope, and because of this hope, we should experience our suffering through the lens of the hope that we have. And he later writes about this same hope in chapter 8 of, of this verse, of this book of Romans. And saying basically what we're experiencing in this, in this uh, gloryful suffering and tribulation does not compare to the glory that God wants us to truly experience when we are with Him. Amen somebody. And I know we're all looking forward to that great getting up morning. I ain't looking to it for it forward to it anytime soon. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. But while we are yet looking and waiting with the expectation of hope. And we're experiencing the various sufferings in our lives. We should experience it through the lens of joy, gladness, and boast, boastfulness. Knowing Is that boastfulness a word? Might not be. I just made that. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> either way, we should look at it through that perspective. And in looking through that perspective, we in turn have a greater sense of connection, relationship with God. So now let's get back to this idea of the suffering of the innocent. 
we find um, several scriptures that can um, support the idea of suffering for the uh, suffering of the innocents. I'd like to point out three in particular. The first comes from um, Exodus, Exodus chapter one, and, and through chapter three. When you read through those chapters, it tells the story of how when uh, Joseph had passed and Egypt got a new pharaoh who knew not Joseph and was not kind towards the Hebrew uh, because it said the text says that they had grown and had become so influential and wealthy and amassed a great deal of uh, influence within the Egyptian society and this pharaoh wanted to put an end to it and so first what he did is he basically uh, sent out an order to confiscate them and uh, remove them from uh, the greater Egyptian Empire to, to what we could consider as a ghetto and turn them in, in so many words and turn them into uh, a place where they would be limited in their influence and in their wealth. Uh, but that did not stop their growth because they kept having babies. And because they kept having babies, this same pharaoh or a pharaoh after him, was, we, we, it really is unclear, but we can assume it's the same pharaoh. Uh, this same pharaoh issued an order to the midwives and said, uh, look, if, you, if the midwives of the Hebrew children, uh, Hebrew women, when they have a baby, do your best not to let it live. Because all the things, policies we're instituting to keep them oppressed is not working. And we need you to abort them, in so many words. And so he issued this, this decree that every male child in particular would be uh, assassinated, murdered. Because it was his intent to hinder the influence, the growth of the Hebrews. And by this time we get to the story of Moses and um, the, degree had, the decree had gone forth and many of the Hebrew midwives said, uh, other midwives for the Hebrew women said, well, we can't stop them from having babies. They're so strong, so we can't stop them from having babies. <laughs> you know, they're stronger than the Egyptian women. They, they put up good fights and most times they, they didn't have it before we even got there. So... He puts out the edict, the decree, issues a new policy, or an executive order. <laughs> Y'all got that one. Uh, to have those babies killed. Moses' mother has, his, has Moses and does her best to hide him for as long as she can. She hides him till he is no longer able to, she's no longer able to do so. She makes a basket, puts him in. And intentionally sets him up for success by uh, seafaring him to be found by Pharaoh's uh, sister or daughter. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, Pharaoh's sister. Um, long story short, uh, while the other children were being killed, um, Moses is saved. But this is the suffering of the innocent because uh, they were not, those children were not supposed to grow up. And they were suffering simply because of their ethnic identity. The children were made, uh, the, the mothers were forced to kill their children because of their ethnic identity, because of the insecurity of a nation in particular a pharaoh and I, I know there may be some overtones to what some may be considering happening here in the states I I don't want to uh, imply that there I don't want to interject the, this into the scripture um, 
But that's the suffering of the innocents. That's one case of the suffering of the innocents. These innocent children um, were forced, were killed, were aborted, were done so largely because uh, one ruler wanted to dwindle, to diminish the influence, the wealth, and the population of the Hebrews. The second comes from the book of Job. And I'm sure many of you have read this book probably backwards and forwards. And you know the story of Job and in chapter 1 of Job. By the way, if you didn't know, Job is considered to be the oldest book uh, by, by historically within the text of the Hebrew Bible. Um, that Job is considered to be the oldest text in the Hebrew Bible. Therefore, the oldest text in uh, the collective Bible that we have. But the Bible says that uh, Satan was walking along with the other uh, uh, angels and God struck up a conversation with him. And in the conversation, Job comes up and is deemed so righteous that he would never, you know, he's so righteous, he, he doesn't sin. He hadn't sinned, he hadn't done anything. He was upright. And because he was upright, uh, the uh, Satan, Satan, uh, which is a different different character, different character uh, from the Satan of the New Testament, that may or may not be the same. Well, definitely different from Lucifer in the scripture of Isaiah. And Lucifer, by all accounts, is more figurative and uh, cloaked language regarding a particular ruler. Anyway, so they have this conversation and Satan says that, um, that the only reason that Job is faithful to God is because God protects him. God has a hedge of protection and God provides for him and God does all that. And he said, but God, if you remove all that, he'll curse you. And God gives Satan uh, permission to do that. Removes the hedge. Job gives him permission to inflict all kinds of suffering on him and his family. Um, and the story goes when you read through it, that uh, eventually he loses just about everything, including all of his children. And his wife says, why are you still being faithful to God? Why are you still holding out to God? Why don't you just curse God and die? He said, you're sounding like a foolish woman. You, 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 you should know me better than that. You should know God better than that. This, uh, this is happening to me for some reason. And whatever it may be happening for, uh, I still have a responsibility to trust God, and not only to trust God, but to completely trust God. And when you read throughout the, the story of Job, and his friends come and they share uh, other engagements and conversations, and Job, uh, on at least two occasions in the text, wishes he had died. He wishes suicide upon himself. He gets into this the manic depressive state and um, we hear some of the wonderful words that we use in funerals now. Man that is born of a woman is but a few days <laughs> and language just like that. But we also hear beautiful language that uh, I, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last day he shall come. You know, we hear that language in the midst of the suffering that he is experiencing for no apparent reason. This is no apparent reason that he is experiencing this suffering. Right? And while his friends try to try to convince him that he has done something to bring it upon himself, bring this suffering upon himself, he... Uh, doesn't language in it and again eventually he has a talk with God and he and God have a conversation and God says where were you when I did all this you know you questioning me you know you should know me better than that 
But in the end, the suffering does come to a, a close. And when it comes to a close, the scripture says that not only is he restored, but he is restored doubly for what he lost. So he had 10 children, he ends up having 20. <laughs> he had multiple servants, he ended up having a multitude of servants, and so forth and so on. You can use the imagery of however you choose to use it. But he is rewarded for his dutifulness and his faithfulness. And and all of that, and so that that is the case. When you get a chance, if you have not read through it, I invite you to read through that book of Job. Jackson wants to say hi. Say hi, Jackson. Y'all say hi to Jackson. Say hi. Yeah, he he wanted to. Ah, uh, don't don't be looking at me like that. <laughs> he just wanted to sit in my lap. So I let him sit in my lap while I do Bible study. I no, I'm working. Anyway, so that's the second story of suffering of the innocents. The third one that I want to address is found in the book in the Gospel of Saint John, Saint John chapter nine. And in this text, we find the story of a man who was born blind. And the Bible says that Jesus was coming into this area and he sees this man uh, who apparently somehow they learned that he was born blind. And the question is asked to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus responds by saying, uh, neither of them sinned, but this entire condition is for the glory of God. The entirety of this man's life of suffering, being born blind and having to become a beggar and having to be led around and basically deemed an outcast, the entirety of his, his, uh, his lifespan was to lead to this one moment, this one encounter with Jesus Christ. And it is in this encounter with Jesus Christ that the man's blindness is healed. And the man's blindness is healed and he goes with rejoicing, he shares, he said, look, the Lord, he, I'm, I'm healed and he, I'm healed and everyone's question say, wait a minute, who did this to you? Who, who did this for you? And he says, who did it? And the uh, narrator continues, well, go get his parents. Get his parents. Let's 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 make sure that this is the right person. And uh, again, his parents come and say, "He's old enough to talk for himself. He's he's able to speak for himself. If he said what he said, then that is what happened. We can't explain it because we know his. We've known his conditions since birth. And although we don't understand it, if he's happy, we're happy." And God has blessed him miraculously. And that's all we can do. So those are three accounts of suffering of the innocent. Okay. Now there are, there are several others. But those are three that I just wanted to use, particularly as an example, to help you see. And to kind of give a, a sense of an answer to the question, why do good people suffer? Or why do bad things happen to good people? And there are a number of other reasons. But from the perspective of suffering for the glory of God. Okay. Now, when it comes to this, the text that Paul writes. And Paul says that we should, we should glory in our sufferings. We should exalt. And exalt. E X. U L T exult. We should glory. We should exult. We should boast. We should brag in our suffering, because the condition of the suffering has a greater purpose. All right. Now, going to those three uh, narratives that I show share with you, those three case studies in the suffering of the innocent, all three of them had an outcome 
that led to the glory of God. God being glorified. Uh, all three had the same outcome. With Moses, because of the wisdom given to his mother and because of the connection his sister had, all of that, uh, he is provided an opportunity to live uh, as nobility. He becomes a part of the royal family, raised as a royal family member. And when you read through chapter 4, you see that he is eventually given positions of authority within the Egyptian uh, community or, or, or nobility. He's given his position of authority. And um, then he realizes that he's a Hebrew. You know, he, he realized that he's an immigrant. He realizes that he has been transported into this community. And he's not quite an anchor baby, to use the, the language that is in modern vernacular. It's not quite that, but he comes to the realization that he has to identify with the people who were oppressed. He has to identify with the people who uh, he was taught to look down to, and he chooses to do so. Good afternoon, uh, Sister Briscoe. Uh, he chooses to do so, and in doing so, y'all know the story, he comes across one of those Hebrews uh, who uh, they're fighting, they're arguing, and he kills, he had already killed someone because of uh, rage issues. You know, no rioting, just rage. He, he killed someone, and, and when he tries to help his own kinsmen, and they, they threaten to rat, rat him out, he flees into exile. But it was in exile that he had the experience on the backside of the mountain, where he sees that burning bush, and has that conversation with the Lord, and the Lord tells him who he is. The Lord tells him, well, who do I, when he asked, well, who do I tell him sent me? He said, tell him that I am. That's who I am. That's all you need to know. And it led to Moses becoming the emancipator for those uh, descendants of Israel. For those descendants of Joseph. For all those people, Moses becomes the, uh, the, the, the emancipator. God uses him to do so. Moses had to experience 40 years of suffering himself. And in doing so, he, you know, God, God uses him. In the story of Job, as we stated before, um, because of what Job had experienced, the Lord used Job's suffering both to teach him about who he was as the Lord. And when you read through the last few chapters, of uh, Job, you find that in the dialogue between God and and Job, God helps Job see the breadth and, and the depth of who he was as the Lord, and, and, and the expanse of the experience that he had, and and um, in doing that. God rewards Job by again doubling him. And in the text with the the young man who was born blind, uh, that God used this young man to allow Jesus to come to uh, do a miracle. And during this miracle, the young man it becomes a testimony. And when you read through all of this, through all of chapter 9, it allows Jesus to affirm his deity, in uh, particular uh, in, in John chapter 9, verse 39, Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may be, uh, so those who do not see may see 
and those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. So this is a this is the sense of uh, uh, a purposeful mission accomplished by Jesus Christ, where he, where he says, um, where he uses, he's used to bring about healing. This healing is used to bring about testimony. This testimony is used about bring is used to bring about uh, conviction, and a conviction that helps those persons, particularly these Pharisees, realize. That they were not as righteous as they thought. Okay, So suffering has a means to an end. Suffering is not a means to an end in and of itself. But the experience of suffering that we have within this human existence. The condition and the moments of suffering that we have has a means to an end. And that means is to always bring about glory to God. We do not like the suffering, but the suffering has a means to an end. And that's what Paul is, is and James both, uh, as they write, particularly going back to Romans chapter 5, uh, Paul again says that the sufferings that we experience are is intentional and is purposeful. One, uh, we know that suffering, tribulation, bring about perseverance. The long-term assurance, the long-term ability to stay in the faith. To persevere through the events that bring suffering in our lives, either because of our faith or because of uh, our Punitive sin, uh, you know, it's the punitive suffering that comes that we discussed before. But either way, uh, it brings about a long-term sense of resilience. To be able to carry on in spite of what we may be experiencing through our suffering. Not only that, but suffering, brings, not only does suffering bring about tribulation, I mean perseverance, but uh, perseverance proven character now when we did our study on the fruit of the spirit earlier this year we talked about uh, the fruit uh, coming from the Holy Spirit one fruit being uh, expressed in different manifestations or different ways but the same conclusion is to be used as a means of uh, witnessing and making disciples the fruit of the spirit is to be used as a means of witnessing and making disciples. And one of those fruit we talked about, uh, well, all those fruit are what we say, what, what some would consider as character traits. But we don't see them through the, through the lens of Scripture. We don't see them as character traits. We see them as God traits. These are because it comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the giver of these fruit. This is attribute. These are God qualities, all right, and so when it comes to proven character, you have proven character because the Holy Spirit is empowering you during these moments of perseverance while you're enduring suffering, endure hardship as a good soldier. As one, what one one writer says, as you're enduring these this hardship, this suffering, this this tribulation, whatever it, you would like to call it, as you are enduring these things, the Holy Spirit is, and then in turn. Developing in you the character that is necessary to be witnesses for Christ. To be able to go out into the world, the great commandment. To go out into the world and make disciples. We cannot do that with flawed character. And unfortunately, if you've been like me, you, you see enough flawed character of people in the church. That has driven people away from the institutional church, the organizational church. And I completely understand that because if I were in the past, I'd probably be doing the same thing. I'd probably have nothing to do with church folk. Because church folk can work your nerves. Amen, lights. Church folk can just push every button. But 
what Paul is writing and what God wants us to understand is that the development of our character inwardly leads to our expression of God's glory. The inward development of our character as God matures us, as God tries us, as God proves us and with our character, that in turn is expressed outwardly th through what people would see as God's grace on us. And God's grace on us then empowers us to be witnesses for Him and lead to making disciples. Y'all following me? Is that leading to making disciples that we should uh, we should be concerned about? Not only does perseverance uh, lead, uh, not only tribulation lead or suffering leads to perseverance, but it leads to proven character. And he's saying that proven character leads to hope. And this is where I really love verses uh, five. And he says, "Hope does not disappoint." Let's go back to what he says in verse number 2 in chapter 5 and connect this with verse 5 in chapter 5. Verse 2 says, Through whom we all have obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult, we brag, we boast in hope of the glory of God. And then Paul turns around and says, that hope does not disappoint. The fact that you experience suffering, you are to experience suffering in the, uh, with the hope that you're going to come out of that suffering better than you in, into that suffering. You're going to come out of that suffering with something greater than what you that that you thought you 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 didn't need or that you didn't expect that you would need you come out of that with the hope for something greater not just because you you know when you just think about the tough times that you've experienced in your natural life be it brought on by someone else be it brought on by yourself or just be it brought on by uh just living if you live long enough you're gonna go through something yeah, and you know, you might just be coming out of something. You might be in something now, or you may be on your way into something. That's what uh, old church folk used to say when it came to suffering and trouble and all that. You, you ain't in it now. You're gonna be in it then, and you know it may not be affecting you now, but it could, you don't know it could be affecting you soon. But Paul says this hope that we have, this hope is based in the grace. Of God it's based in the grace of God it's based in the fact that God has uh, looked beyond our faults and Paul writes again going back referencing chapter 3 verse 23 because our condition is sinful because as he writes in chapter 4 no matter how good we are our righteousness is still nothing but it's, it's best filthy rags and because of all of that we have one thing that we can only rely on, and that is the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassions of God, that fail not. That's why we ought to be grateful and say, thank you for your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to us. Lord unto me, great is your faithfulness. That hope does not disappoint because that hope is not rooted in a temporary displacement of our uh, of what we experience because as long as we're going through something it's a temporary displacement we seem out of place but we we should cling to the hope and like the old like the hymn says build your hope on things eternal hold to God's unchanging hand and Paul follows this thought up throughout the writings here in chapter 6 chapter 5 chapter 6 chapter 7 and in and, and chapter 8 particularly as we read through chapter 8 verses 26 on to the end it says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose from whom he foreknew what now whom he foreknew he also called and them he called he also justified and those he justified he also what glorified 
So as we experience this this sense of of suffering, this as, as we as we go through suffering, no matter what it is, if it's punitive suffering, if we are suffering because of sin, you know, we made decisions, we've had sinful behaviors, and we're dealing with the consequence of those behaviors or those whatever it may have been, those decisions, then we should still rest that suffering in the hope that God will still be glorified. Right? That He will mature us. He will He will bring us out better than where we were. He will be like the refiner's fire and, and purify us. My God, I felt that. Ain't nothing wrong with being purified by the fire of the Lord. It's not good when you're going through it. But ooh, when you come out, you come out as pure gold. I wish somebody was here with me to just just shout right there. Because, I, I, you know, we go through things and sometimes we don't understand, understand the totality of the experience of suffering. And in, in some church faith traditions... We, as I stated earlier, been conditioned totally to ignore suffering. That if you're experiencing suffering of any kind, that's on you. Some you did. You're not supposed to experience suffering, but we know that isn't the case, as we have gone through our case studies regarding the suffering of the innocent. Now, um, I'm gonna close out with this. And if you have any questions, please feel free. I, I have not read through. Uh, discussions the, the comments are amen thank you thank you thank you thank you so Paul uses this whole text in in verse 6 in uh, verse let me put it this way verse 6 through 8 and even though I didn't include this in our initial uh, textual reading verse 6 but we were still for while we were still helpless at the right time God sent Christ. Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone may consider to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that gets into the dear, the, the, uh, the next uh Thing of suffering that we experience and that is called redemptive suffering and we'll talk about that uh, if the Lord allows next week but the totality uh, what I want to get want us to get from this is there there are there are moments where we will suffer just because we're trying to do right and you can be considered that you can consider that as a suffering of the innocent when you're just trying to live right and you have, it seems like, I, you like me, you, you try to live right, there's always hell somewhere. You know, um, but even in the midst of that, God is still using that, or God still intends to use that to His glory. God still intends to use that to glorify Him, to make us testimonies of, and witnesses to him who in turn go out and make disciples as we, we, we as we share this gospel of Jesus Christ and this gospel that involves suffering as we go and we share how the Lord delivered us, how the Lord saved us how the Lord spared us, how the Lord was merciful to us, how the Lord is benevolent towards us as we go out and share that within the, the construct, I'm just knocking over stuff, within the construct of grace and hope, we in turn turn folk not to the church because we see the institutional church has more than enough lack and more than enough suffering inflicted on itself and towards others. We turn them to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of their faith, who for the joy set beside him endured the shame of the cross. 
beloved, and I just want you to know that um, suffering will happen. There's no escaping it. Uh, as we stated last week, the, the suffering, punitive suffering because of our sins, because of our condition, because of our behaviors, our thoughts, our deeds, our words. And then there's the suffering of the innocent. As, as we stated, you know, sometimes uh, there are conditions that uh, bring about suffering in people's lives that are occurring to eventually lead to the glory of God and the making of disciples. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's pretty much all I have. I don't. I don't want to uh, waste any more time. I really appreciate you all for joining. Thank you so much for commenting. Uh, I do want to encourage you to share this video, like this video, share it on all your social media. Um, as we prepare to close out, uh, we will be praying. Um, as always, we, we pray during the week. Uh, at noon, every day, that's that's our prayer time. Well, that's my prayer time uh, during this pandemic. As, as much as I can, get it in. You know, I'm praying daily, but I try to be intense and uh, intentional in praying at that particular time but uh we we do solicit your prayers on behalf of our leadership our national leadership for those are vying to be in national leadership uh that includes our elected officials um, pray for our our mayors pray for the right now there's more violence breaking out more rioting breaking out uh in kenosha wisconsin of all places Pray for those that, those communities that are being impacted negatively by the riots, by the protests, and all of this. Yeah. Communities like Portland, Seattle, uh, now Kenosha, and other places, Chicago, where there's uh, New York, there, where there's uh, overwhelming uh, negative activity um, that's happening, that's negatively impacting those communities. Um, Pray for each other, uh, and I do want to mention before I go into prayer that uh, this coming Sunday we invite you to join New Bethel for worship at 10 a.m. stream live. As always, uh, this will be our mission Sunday, and uh, we have a guest speaker. And her name evades me right now, but uh, we have a guest speaker for our mission Sunday. And our Mission Sunday is put on by our Women's Missionary Society. And we're looking forward to that. And that will be this coming fifth Sunday. Uh, at, streamed at 10 a.m. on the New Bethel Amy Church uh, Facebook page. And the New Bethel Amy Church Jackson YouTube page. So you can go to either one of those sites. And also be streamed here on my personal Facebook page and uh, social media. So you can go there and join us for worship. Uh, continue to support. We really do appreciate your support. Uh, if you do not know how to support New Bethel, you can give physically by uh, mailing it to our church address and the information. Well, if you go to the Facebook page, uh, New Bethel Facebook page, you find all that. Or by way of Givelify, you can do that. Uh, but anyway, that's all that I have. We thank you. Um, also, I want to put a tune in. Uh, if you are watching me live. I also do um, a Zero Today radio show, and um, you can go to uh, LorenzoTNeal.com and tune into the radio show, as well as the Be Your Differentiated Self uh, podcast. That's all on my website. So I'm just putting a little plug in for myself while you're there. <laughs> but anyway, all minds and hearts are clear. Uh, let us go to the Lord as we close out. God of grace and mercy, thank you again for this opportunity to study your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Your word sanctifies us because your word is truth. Now, God, be with us as we go through this week, the rest of the days. Keep our hearts and minds centered on you. Keep us uh, ever in your presence and ever ready to serve this present age. I call to fulfill. Again, forgive us of all our sins. Bless us. Pray for those uh, in our leadership, for our president, Donald Trump, for our governors, for our mayors, and for all those impacted in these cities that we've mentioned. We pray for victims of domestic violence, gun violence, and suicide. Have mercy. 
We not only pray for them, we pray for our children who are in school. We pray for our uh, those teachers, those administrators. Be merciful to them. And now, God, uh, as we leave from this place, but never your presence, go with us and stand by us until we meet again. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you all so much for joining us. Be sure to share and like. And this video uh, will be up on, um, it, it is on the New Bethel Facebook page as well as will be on the New Bethel YouTube channel. You guys, thank you so much. God bless you. God keep you.